So uh, over my career, I learned something. First of all, I'm really not very bright. You'll find that out as I speak. And when I was uh, in high school, I took extra time to get through. Like uh, two of the best years of my life were spent in the ninth grade. <laughs> and so uh, when it came time to get married, my father said, you better find somebody really smart. That way your kids have a chance of being normal. <laughs> so I did. I found a girl that was summa cum laude. And I graduated Lottie, how come? <laughs> so how did I manage to get up to a senior vice president in a company like Emerson? And it certainly isn't because of gray matter. I can guarantee you that. I think my key to success and your key to success was that I learned how to speak in seminary. Janet got it just a little bit backwards. I actually went to seminary right after engineering school and uh, then tried that for a while, decided I was an engineer, not a, a preacher, and now I'm back in being a preacher. Well, what does that tell you? But anyway, I learned in a course called homiletics how to put a speech together. And I just used that formula all my career, and I kept it a secret. But now I'm 67. I play more golf than I do engineering. And so it's time to share the secret. So I'm going to share the secret to you, with you this, this afternoon. It's very simple. And so once you get it, it will be easy. Speeches really are quite important. In fact, movies are made about speeches. Mike was right. It is the number one phobia that people have. People are scared to death to stand up on a stage. I'm afraid right now because we've got standing room only. And so everyone, I don't care who it is, is afraid to give a speech. But you can overcome that fear, just as King George overcame his fear. How many saw the king's speech? Wasn't that, wow, that's great. Well, that was one of my favorite movies. Because King George had a speech impediment, and he felt that that disqualified him from being king. Not only did it not disqualify him, but as king, he saved the nation with a speech because the bombs were falling on London, looked like everything was going, over, going the Nazis' way, and he rose up to the challenge, and he made a speech, and you all know who saw the movie. It wasn't just his speech. Down through history, speeches have changed things. We just went through a 150-year uh, uh, celebration or remembrance of Gettysburg. At the end of that battle, which over 50,000 people died, that's more than Vietnam, two speeches were given, one you remember and one you don't remember. I took a chance to read this speech from uh, Edward Everett. It was two and a half hours long. But it was a great speech. Too bad nobody remembers it. And then there was one by Abe Lincoln, three minutes, and many of us had to, rem had to memorize it when we were in school. What was the difference between those two speeches? Was it length? Yes. But that's not the real difference. Lincoln connected. He connected with his audience. I want you to look at that picture very carefully. It, there is no picture. It's a drawing. But it was an accurate drawing. Did he use notes? I want you to understand right away you can use notes. What's important about giving speeches are the words. Words are important. So think about that first and foremost. What you say is far more important than what you look like, how you deliver it, what your dress is, your elocution, everything. Lincoln read his speech. Three minutes, he read it. Great speakers do that. So we're going to go in and we're going to look at different speeches. Most speeches in the engineering community are terrible. We call it death by PowerPoint. And how many of you have been in a presentation where it's death? Well, that's unanimous, right? <laughs> death by PowerPoint. Now, I happen to work for Emerson, and we are masters at death by PowerPoint. I have, without my CEO's presentation, uh, per permission, lifted one of his presentations. This is directly from David Farr, our CEO. He gave this presentation. This was his opening slide. This is Emerson's 2012 summary, and I just want you to think about the free cash flow and the DPS and the ROTC 
Doesn't that thrill you? His second slide was this, the reconciliation of non-GAAP financial measures. How many engineers were motivated by this speech? Zero. It's good for the analyst, but it wasn't good for the audience he presented it to. So your audience is important. I think Peter Drucker said it best. We showed this in the general plenary, but who knows Peter Drucker? This great analyst of the former century said, as soon as you move up one step from the bottom, that means you move up from janitor, what you say is important. If you move up one step from the bottom, your effectiveness depends on your ability to reach others through the spoken and the written word. How many believe that? Absolutely. Your career depends on it. And so today, we're going to try and keep you from building a speech and giving a speech that goes up in smoke. And as we saw, said in the plenary, uh, the objective of this course is to make you insanely great in front of any audience. Now, my next slide is a speech. It's given at an organization called TED. Who's heard of TED? A few of you, have, if you haven't heard of TED, this is a place out in California, and you thought it was expensive to come to this place, $1,200. It costs $4,000 to go and hear TED speeches for one day. And they bring the best of the best, I've never been invited, uh, to come and give speeches. I have lifted one right off the internet from a man named Steven Johnson. He's an engineer, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about how GPS was invented. I'd like you not to listen specifically to the words he said, although you can't help by doing that. I want you to look at his technique. And as soon as it's over, I'll come back and, and we'll talk about what he did as a matter of putting this speech together. Here he is. Just a few minutes ago, uh, I took this picture uh, about 10 blocks from here. This is the Grand Cafe uh, here in Oxford. I took this picture because this turns out to be the first coffee house to open in England in, in 1650. That's its great claim to fame. And I wanted to show it to you not because I want to give you the kind of, you know, Starbucks tour of historic England, um, but rather because the English coffee house was crucial to the development uh, and spread of one of the great intellectual flowerings uh, uh, of the last 500 years, what we now call the Enlightenment. And the coffee house played such a big role in, in the birth of the Enlightenment, in part because of what people were drinking there, right? Because before the, uh, the, the spread of coffee and, and tea through British culture, what people drank, both elite and, and mass folks drank day in and day out from, from dawn until dusk, was alcohol, right? Alcohol was the daytime beverage of choice. You would drink a little beer with breakfast and have a little wine at lunch, a little gin, particularly around 1650, um, and uh, top it off with a little beer and, and wine at the end of the day. That was the healthy choice, right? Because the water wasn't safe to drink. Uh, and so effectively, in, until the rise of the coffee house, you had an entire population that was effectively drunk all day. Um, <laughs> And you can imagine what that would be like, right, in your own life, and I know this is true of some of you, if you were drinking all day, and, and then you switched from a depressant to a stimulant in your life, you would have better ideas. Um, you would be sharper and more alert, and so it's not an accident that a great flowering of innovation happened uh, as England switched to, to tea and coffee. But the other thing that makes the coffee house important is the, is the architecture of the space. It was a space where people would get together from different backgrounds, different fields of expertise, and share. It was a space, as Matt Ridley talked about, where ideas could have sex, right? This was their conjugal bed, in a sense. Ideas would get together there. And an astonishing number of innovations from this period have a coffee house somewhere in, in, in their story. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about coffee houses for the last five years uh, because I've been kind of in, on this quest to investigate this question of where good ideas come from. What are the environments that lead to unusual levels of innovation, um, unusual levels of, of, of creativity? What's the kind of environmental, what is the space of creativity? And what I've done is I've looked at both environments, like the coffee house, I've looked at like media environments, like the World Wide Web, that have been extraordinarily innovative. I've gone back to the, the, the history of the first cities. I've even gone to biological environments, like coral reefs and, and rainforests, that involve unusual levels of biological innovation. And what I've been looking for is shared patterns, kind of signature behavior that shows up again and again in all of these environments. Are there 
recurring patterns that we can learn from, that we can take and kind of apply to our own lives, or our own organizations, our own environments, to make them more creative and innovative. And I think I've found a few. In fact, the spaces that have historically led to innovation tend to look like this, right? This is Hogarth's famous painting of a kind of political dinner at a tavern, but this is what the coffee shops looked like back then. This is the kind of chaotic environment where ideas were likely to come together, where people were likely to have kind of new, interesting, unpredictable collisions, people from different backgrounds. So if we're trying to build organizations that are more innovative, we have to build spaces that, strangely enough, look a little bit more like this. This is what your office should look like. It's part of my message here. Um, the other problem that people have is they like to condense their stories of innovation down to kind of shorter time frames. So they want to tell the story of the Eureka moment. They want to say, there I was, I was standing there, and I had it all suddenly clear in my head. But in fact, if you go back and look at the historical record, it turns out that a lot of important ideas have very long incubation periods. I call this the slow hunch. We've heard a lot recently about you know, kind of hunch and instinct and kind of blink-like uh, sudden moments of clarity. But in fact, a lot of great ideas linger on, sometimes for decades, in the back of people's minds. They have a feeling that there's an interesting problem, but they don't quite have the tools yet to discover them. Um, they spend all this time, you know, kind of working on certain problems, but there's another thing lingering there that they're interested in, but they can't quite solve. And that is actually how great ideas often happen. They fade into view over long periods of time. Now, the challenge for all of us is, how do you create environments that allow these ideas to have this kind of long half-life, right? It's hard to go to your boss and say, I have an excellent idea for our organization. It will be useful in 2020. Uh, could you just give me some time to do that? Now, a couple of companies like Google, they have innovation time off, 20% time. Where, in a sense, those are hunch cultivating uh, mechanisms in an organization. But that's, that's a, a key thing. And the other thing is to allow those hunches to connect with other people's hunches. That's what often happens. You have half of an idea, somebody else has the other half, and if you're in the right environment, they turn into something larger than the sum of their parts. So in a sense, we often talk about the value of protecting intellectual property, you know, building barricades, having secretive R&D labs, um, patenting everything that we have, so that those ideas will remain valuable and people will be incentivized to come up with more ideas and, and the culture will be more innovative. But I think there's a case to be made that we should spend at least as much time, if not more, valuing the premise of connecting ideas and not just protecting them. And I'll leave you with this story, which I think captures a lot of these values. Um, and it's just a, just a wonderful kind of tale of innovation and how it happens in unlikely ways. It's October of 1957, and Sputnik has just launched. And we're in Laurel, Maryland, at the uh, Applied Physics Lab associated with Johns Hopkins University. And it's Monday morning, and the news has just broken about this satellite that's now orbiting the planet. And of course, this is nerd heaven, right? Uh, there are all these physics geeks who are there thinking, oh my gosh, this is incredible. I can't believe this has happened. And two of them, two 20-something researchers at the APL, are there at the cafeteria table having an informal conversation with a bunch of their colleagues. And these two guys are named Geyer and Weifenbach. And they start talking, and, and one of them says, hey, you know, has anybody tried to listen for this thing? There's this you know, man-made satellite up there in outer space that's obviously broadcasting some kind of signal. We could probably hear it if we tune in. And so they ask around to a couple of their colleagues, and, and everybody's like, no, I hadn't thought of doing that. That's, you know, that's an interesting idea. And it turns out Weifenbach is kind of an ex expert in microwave uh, reception, and he's got a little antenna set up with an amplifier in his office. And so Geyer and Weifenbach go back to Weifenbach's office, and they start kind of noodling around, hacking, as we might call it now. And after a couple of hours, they actually start picking up this signal, because the Soviets made um, Sputnik very easy to track. It was right at 20 megahertz, so that you could, you could pick it up really easily, because they were afraid that people would think it was a hoax, basically. So they made it really easy to, to find it. And so these two guys are sitting there listening to this signal, and, and people start kind of coming into the office and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. Can I hear? Wow, that's great. And, and before long, they think, well, geez, this is kind of historic. We may be the first people in the United States to be listening to this. We should record it. And so they bring in this big, clunky analog tape recorder, and they start recording these little bleep, bleeps, um, and they start writing down the kind of date stamp, time stamps for each, for each little bleep that they record. And then they start thinking, well, gosh, you know, we're noticing small little frequency variations here. We could probably calculate the speed that the satellite is traveling if we, if we do a little basic math here using the, the Doppler effect. And then they played around with it a little bit more, and they talked to a couple of their colleagues who had other kind of specialties. And 
they said, geez, you know, I think we could actually look at the slope of the Doppler effect to figure out the points at which the satellite is closest to our antenna and the points at which it's furthest away. That's pretty cool. And eventually they get permission, this is all a little side project that you know, hadn't been officially part of their job description, but they get permission to use the new you know, UNIVAC computer that takes up an entire room that they'd just gotten at the APL, and they, they run some more of the numbers. And at the end of about three or four weeks, it turns out they have mapped the exact trajectory of this satellite around the Earth just from listening to this one little signal going off on this little side hunch that they've been inspired to do over, over lunch one morning. A couple of weeks later, their boss, Frank McClure, pulls him into the room and says, hey, you guys, uh, I have to ask you something about that project you were working on. You've figured out um, an unknown location uh, of a satellite orbiting the planet from a known location on the ground. Could you go the other way? Could you figure out an unknown location on the ground if you knew the location of the satellite? And they thought about it, and they said, well, I, I guess maybe you could. Um, let's, let's run the numbers here. And so they went back, and they thought about it, and they came back and said, actually, it'll be easier. Um, and he said, oh, that's great, because, see, I have these new nuclear submarines that I'm building, and it's really hard to figure out how to get your missile so that it will land right on top of Moscow if you don't know where the submarine is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So we're thinking we could throw up a bunch of satellites and use it to track our submarines and figure out their location in the middle of the ocean. Could you work on that problem? And that's how GPS was born. 30 years later, Ronald Reagan actually opened it up and made it an open platform um, that anybody could kind of build upon and anybody could come along and build new technology that would, uh, that would create and innovate on top of this open platform. Left it open for, for, for anyone to do pretty much anything they wanted with it. And now, I guarantee you, you know, certainly half this room, if not more, has a device sitting in their pocket right now that is talking to one of these satellites in outer space. And I bet you, one of you, if not more, has used said device and said satellite system to locate a nearby coffee house somewhere in the last, <laughs> in the last day or last week, right? That is how innovation happens. Chance favors the connected mind. Thank you very much. OK, let's analyze the speech. First of all, did you like it? It was great, right? What was it about that speech that made it great? Story. Stories. Story. Absolutely, stories. Write that down. What else? <laughs> no words on the screen. No, simple slides. Write that down. He what? You could relate to him. That initial story that he started out with was something we all do. do. We get a cup of coffee, a cup of joe in the morning. How many points did he have? Three. Three. What were, you probably don't remember them, but I've got them here. Um, he talked about three points, the liquid network, the slow hunch, and connecting versus protecting. And, as far as innovation is concerned. He had three points. Remember that. Most good speeches only have three points. It's about as much as we can remember. So we're going to drive that point home. It was simple. It was memorable. And the thing he did that caused everybody in this uh, auditorium, I was going to say congregation, but I can't do that, in this congregation to know when he was finished was what? He started with an illustration. What did he do? He ended with the same illustration. All good speeches do that. You start with a story, you complete it with a story. When you do that, a bow is tied on your speech. Everybody knows you're finished. Most engineers are watching the clock, and when the time runs out, they say, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. That's the worst thing you can say. That means you're not prepared. You haven't thought through your speech, and you've done it just as long as the time allows, and then you're done. That means you haven't prepared well. So we're going to put three points up. The first one is the look. Today, people trans, uh, they take information, and they process it in different ways than former generations. We process information today very differently. Information is free, so we have to grab the emotions. So we have to grab a look, then the book, then the hook. So I have three points today, the look, the book, the hook. And it's, it's memorable because they all rhyme. That is a good speech when you can do that. So let's start with the look. 
you have 25 seconds or 30 seconds at most to capture the imagination of your audience. People are saying, is this worth my time? And the last thing you should do is give a resume of yourself. It kills everything. You don't need to tell them about your company. You don't need to tell them about yourself. They're not interested in you. They're interested in what they can take away. So the look is very important. We have to capture the imagination. And as engineers, we're not very good at that. So I think Steve Jobs said it right. He said, you have to be an engineer in your head, but you have to be an artist in your heart. So a good speaker has both talents. You need to have an artistic talent to be able to capture people's imagination. But also, you can't just give stories. You have to give facts. So as engineers, we're going to think like an engineer inside, but we're going to feel like artists. That's what we're going to do today. So we're going to do that by telling stories. Nothing is more compelling than a story. And great speakers build their presentations on stories. They use a common thing called an antagonist. Every speech needs to have something that it's going to kill. You have to erect something that you're going to tear down. Why are you here today? Well, most of you are here because you say, you know, I really need to do better speeches. I'm not that good at giving speeches, so I'm going to that class. My antagonist here today is bad speeches. So create an antagonist. Maybe it's inefficiencies in the plant. Maybe it's plants that are not safe. Create an antagonist and then slay it. So we're going to reveal then the conquering hero that's going to slay the antagonist. Now, in my profession, the ministry, it's boring, right? How many of you heard, have heard boring sermons? How many of you don't go to church anymore because they're boring? Yeah, everybody 20 and below says the same thing. Anybody ever heard of Andy Stanley? Andy Stanley is a pastor that's in Atlanta, Georgia. And if I could only be as creative as Andy. Now, Andy, I promise you that what you're about to hear will not offend you regardless of your religion. But this is how Andy starts a sermon on the conflict in marriages. Listen to this. Now I want to try to illustrate for you exactly what that looks like. And to do that, I have a couple of friends here. This is Mr. and Mrs. Mug. Okay? So say, hey, this is Mr. Mug. And hey, this is Mrs. Mug. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Mug. Now Mr. and Mrs. Mug met right after college. And like many people, when they, you know, he saw her and said, I, ooh, I got, you know, and she's like, woo. You know, and he had a degree and a future, and she was, you know, look at her. I mean, she's a knockout, so she's, all oh, that's working for her. And so they started dating, and you know, when they first started dating and hanging out, they were so careful because he's trying to win her heart, and she's trying to win his affection, and, you know, it's just, they were just so careful. And they had a few little, little problems along the way, and there were a couple of bumps in the relationship, but they were just so careful, and everything was going to be great. And then they got married. And then about a month into their marriage, they had a, a, a problem, they had a bump. And stuff came out. And, <laughs> and, he, and he looked at her and said, whoa, where did all that come from? <laughs> and she looked at him and said, well, I didn't know you had anger issues. And he said, well, I didn't have anger issues till you bumped me. Oh, there it is again. And then they had another problem and they, they just were, so, and she went to see her sister and she said, I didn't know he was like that. And he went to see, he went to see, you know, he went, I don't know, we don't know where guys go. They don't go anywhere, you know. <laughs> he looked in the mirror, perhaps. I don't know. Now, don't you want to hear the rest of that? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, the guy's brilliant. That's an artist. That is pure artist. Now, he could have started out, today we're going to talk about problems in marriage. Turn in your Bibles to such and such a passage, and everybody's, you know, that's the last thing I need is some 5,000-year-old thing on marriage. Andy captures your imagination. Then he will go in for his points. You have to start your speeches that way. Now, one of the things you have to do is to think the way the millennials think because times have changed. Harvard Business Review, which I read regularly, says... It's all different now. We do not communicate by transferring information from us to others. Information is free. It's in your pocket. So at dinner time, how many of you have tried to remember a fact and 
you're talking to your wife or your girlfriend, your spouse, or whoever it is, and you say, oh, I know the answer, and you pull out Google. Information today is free. So what Harvard Business Review says is there's a better way to engage audiences, and it isn't through information. Just think about information for a minute. The, uh, there's certain jobs that just hardly exist anymore. For example, travel agents. How many use the travel agent to get here? Normally, we just go to Expedia, right? And then, of course, there's Yellow Pages. Anybody use Yellow Pages anymore? No. What about Cyclopedia Britannicas? Anybody had an, a salesperson come to the door selling Britannicas? Gone. Even stockbrokers are gone with E-Trade, and now the real estate agent with Zillow is under threat because information is free. So it doesn't help us to dump information into people's heads. If you try and do that, they will start to focus on something else. They'll be on their iPhones, they'll be uh, on the pads, whatever. They're gone because communication today is by feeling, not by fact. Facts are free. You have to grab their feelings. And that's a lot harder to do, so that's what we are going to do in this speech today is grab the feelings. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to create the body of the speech, all right? We look, got their attention with the look. Now we're going to put together the book. In doing so, we have to come to a title. Then we're going to have three points and a conclusion. Pretty simple. Titles. What about titles? Normally, titles are boring. But titles are important. That's what brings people in. Cigarettes for six-year-olds. I was intrigued. I want to hear what this guy has to say. Think of what Hollywood does. Throw some movie titles at me that are very creative. You know, I'm, I'm kind of old, so I remember You Only Die Twice and um, A Beautiful Mind. Give me some titles that are very intriguing. The Big Chill. Great. Good, bad, oh, love it. Good, bad, and ugly. Some more. Catch me if you can. Those are rare, very creative uh, titles. Suppose you're writing a manual on lighting a gas furnace. You could say, this is how you light a gas furnace. How intriguing is that? Or you could put a title on there that says, lighting a gas furnace can be a real blast. <laughs> now, that's much more intriguing. Spend some time thinking about your title make it creative, make it simple, make it memorable, and people will come and they'll remember. That's the point. We have to try and make it memorable, easy to pronounce. Then we have to introduce this antagonist. Remember the old ads in Apple where it was the uh, PC guy and the Apple guy? Who's the hero here, actually? It's actually the PC guy. You could find anybody to do this. He had to be a very special character, but he was teed up as the antagonist. He was corporate IT that was preventing you from being creative. That's what it was all about. If you broke the rules and played this guy without the suit on and all that, you got to be creative, or you could be stilted and stiff because IT forced you into their mold. And so this was the whole beginnings of the bring your own device thing that Steve knew that he had to do in order to break IT. Now, in his book, Biology, that's a funny way to spell it, but it's all about buying things, Martin Lindstrom equates Apple's message with the same powerful ideas that propel widespread religions. What Apple finally figured out is that they were going to get to your emotions, not your intellect. And it worked. So, they teed up an identifiable antagonist. You have to, too, in your speech. In our industry, what would be the antagonist of the deep water horizon? And it's not BP. So, I'll, I'll jump in and say that because there might even be a BP person here. Um, it isn't BP. What is it? No, that's the result. But the cause of this was increasing complexity. As the whole study came out, 
one decision after another was made. It was like Swiss cheese where all the holes lined up. Everybody thought they were making the right decision, but in turn, it turned out to be the wrong decision. They didn't put the right kind of cement down there. They didn't put the centralizers down there. And people were making one bad decision after another because of the complexity of deep water drilling. And so complexity was the villain. We have to fix the complexity. And then we can drill deep again. Uh, how many of you went to a high school graduation recently? Some. Uh, you've all been to them. They all start out with a speech that says the same thing. I am so bored of high school graduations. They'll have some speaker with some credential stand up, and the first thing that they'll say is, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Like that is some big revelation. Duh. And then the second thing they'll say is, you are only limited by your dreams. Now, how many believe that nonsense? <laughs> Anybody have a dream that hasn't been fulfilled? Yeah, by our age, lots of dreams haven't been fulfilled. I never made it to the NBA. I never got invited to TED. I mean, lots of dreams don't come true. And so you're not limited by your dreams. None of that stuff makes any sense. I'm intrigued by Will, Woody Allen. Woody Allen got it right. He stood up. He was asked to give a high school graduation. So he stands up and he says, this generation is faced with a challenge. They stand at the fork in the road. Down this fork is utter destruction. Down this fork is hopelessness and despair. May your generation have the wisdom to choose wisely. And then he sat down. <laughs> and that's true. You know, he really nailed it. Think of our industry. Down the one path is environmental disaster. Down the other path, we're running out of, of energy and food for people because we're trying to be sensitive over here. We are on the horns of a dilemma. And only engineers, by the way, can solve this one. And that's beautiful because that's why you're here. This, that would be a great speech to start with. So we identify antagonists and you got the attention. So I'm going to put a little speech together for you. And uh, because CII is all about safety, I put this speech together. And this is sandwiched in from the, the thing. But it'll give you an idea. I believe that most of the accidents that take place happen at home, not at the, uh, not at the factory or not in the process. They happen at home. So I think that what needs to be happen is that we need to have a certification process for the average weekend warrior. Certif in order to get into Home Depot, you have to show your certificate that you passed the course. <laughs> and because all other professions do that. You know, if you're a lawyer, you have to pass the bar. If you're a doctor, you have to be board certified. And if you're an engineer, you should be a PE. Otherwise, you can't put your stamp on the drawings. And so this is not true, however, for the weekend warrior. The weekend warrior has nothing to, uh, for certification. He can do anything he wants. So we're going to have a three-part speech here. First of all, we're going to look at electrical, then plumbing, then structural. So here's the first uh, illustration, point number one, electrical. If you run out of plugs, just add some more. And if those breakers keep tripping, take them out. They don't, they're not needed anyway. <laughs> if you miss with the conduit, you can just add some of those extra boxes you have. By the way, where was that cover I had? I can't rem remember. And if you don't have enough plugs, just make one with your old soldering iron. <laughs> now we'll move to point two, which is plumbing. This is the sideways trap. And uh, you know, you, there's, there's variations of the sideways trap. Here's another one. And uh, here's the upside down trap. If one trap is good, how about two? We can have two. And if it's leaking and you run out of duct tape and you're red green, you can always use some of that extra electrical tape that you had left over. And if you're in the bathroom and there's not enough space for the sink, go ahead and put it in the shower. There's always room in the shower. And if the ceiling's a little low, of course, just, just poke it through there. And now we'll move to structural. If it'll hold me up, certainly it'll hold the canopy up. And if I want an attic fan, of course, we can just uh, put one in. We'll need duct tape, nails, drywall, all that stuff. And you know, if you're going to put the fence up, make sure you get the right size nails. <laughs> and of course, now, if you've got those gutters that overflow and uh, you can't quite get enough capacity, get out your trusty 22. You can always fix it with your trusty 22. And uh, you always want to make sure you meet code. So when you're building a retaining wall, make sure you meet code as you put those quickcrete uh, sacks there. Of course, the paper will disappear. You will get the wall, but of course, we did meet code with the weep holes. 
So my uh, message to you today is I think we're going to have to have certification required at Home Depot, and there's the certification safety for us all. Any, any, any votes? <laughs> Only a few. Okay. Now, we're going to now move now into a transition sentence. Once you set up the, the, uh, the title, once you've got their attention, you've got to transition them, and you have to ca encapsulate your entire speech with one sentence. The best I've ever seen was, uh, we started with Sputnik this morning, so I'm in the same theme, was when John Kennedy challenged our whole country to go to the moon. Here's the speech. It sends shiver shivers up my spine every time. Here he is. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. But we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. What's his transition sentence? We choose to go to the moon. Now, you're, if Many of you weren't alive at that time, but I was, and I remember him saying this. By that time, we had only done parabolas up into the uh, outer space. We couldn't even get a satellite to go around the planet yet, and he's talking about going to the moon. He challenged an entire nation with one sentence, we choose to go to the moon. He repeated it multiple times through that speech. It was so powerful that it ignited a nation, and we did it. We accomplished that task within the decade. So, here you're gonna put it together. The first thing I wanna tell you is speech making is hard work. Most people are poor speakers because they're lazy. You tend to throw speeches together at the last minute. If your boss asks you to put together a speech to uh, report to management or to some analyst and it has to be tomorrow, what do you say? You should say no because you're being judged every time you give a speech. That's where you will either have a career enhancement or you will not. And if you do a poor speech, they think, well, that person just isn't talented enough. He or she just doesn't have what it takes. And putting together speeches mean you have to read broadly. I'm from the generation that if the boss came by and you were reading a trade journal, he says, get back to work. Anybody work for a company like that? You feel guilty reading a trade manual. But that's where you get ideas. When you read oil and gas, or you read um, nuclear energy, or you're reading the trade journals, that's where you get ideas. So read broadly. Then the next thing is you have to sketch your slides out. Now, I skipped this because I have a PhD in PowerPoint granted to me by Bill Gates. Um, but you can use that uh, light table thing that's part of PowerPoint and sketch your slides. Move them around. And then finally, build your message. It takes long time. People ask me oftentimes how long it takes to put a sermon together. 10 to 15 hours. I write it out word for word every week. I write my speeches out word for word. Now, I don't have that right here, 
but it's because I've done it over and over again. I have that thing in my head. Words are important, really important. So work on that. It'll take you a while to put a speech together. This speech right here took me about 100 hours to put together. And if you don't do that, it won't turn out well. Anybody been to the Sarah Winchester house? This house is fascinating. It's 160,000 square feet. Sarah Winchester was the heir to the Winchester fortune, and she decided she wanted to build the grandest house around. And she did. She had 10,000 windows, doors that went nowhere. She has stairs that go up and just hit a ceiling. And uh, she had 147 contractors, but zero architects. No architects. And she built the house every day, waking up, saying, I think I'd like to do this. And so we had one contractor after another that finally got frustrated and left. So I think Tim Pollard says it well. A speech is a carefully designed journey to a clearly defined destination. Decide where you're going and map it out. That's the way we'll do this. Now, when you map it out, you must connect the dots. People have to keep following you. If you lose them, they're gone. You can't get them back again. So we have to lay it out so that they follow your logic. What do you see here in this picture? Well, I'll make it a little bigger. Now, some people see these two cabins here, and they see this shepherd boy and the sheep. And, and some people see a guy right here. He's uh, got two eyes, a nose, and he's got a little mustache here. Your mind has to go the right place. A lot of times, you'll lead them down this path when you're trying to get them over here, and then you've lost them. So the mind tries to make sense of what it hears, and then it shuts down if it gets confused. If I confuse you, you'll get your iPhones out or your uh, Samsungs, and you'll start doing email. So people remember stories. That's how you bring them back. Tell a story. Now. You're wired to remember three things. There's three parts to the Tolkien trilogy. There were three musketeers. There's three tanners. There's three, for some reason, we like sets of three. As in uh, theology, there's a trinity, all right? Uh, so we like sets of three. So build your speech around three points. Two is okay. Don't go five. And for please, don't put those bullets where you bring them in one after another on the slide, with the build. That'll put them to sleep for sure. The question that I am often asked is, should you use PowerPoints? We are so inundated with PowerPoints, people say, what would it be like without PowerPoints? Well, we're engineers. I think we have to use PowerPoints. We must. That we're communicating some heavy-duty stuff. We're not talking about fluffy stuff. We're not artists. We have to communicate heavy-duty stuff. So we're going to use PowerPoints, even though Wall Street Journal says lots and lots of money is wasted on frivolous PowerPoints. So, but make them simple. Here's a di difficult one. The last thing you ever want to say is, now here's an eye chart. Have you heard that? All of us have heard that. I'm going to put up an eye chart. Now, Mike put up an eye chart, but that was for effect. He said the worst PowerPoint you've ever seen. Yeah, that was for effect. So as a marketing guy, I was trying to convince Emerson that we should use Emerson Process Management rather than Emerson uh, Process Control, and so I made that little slide. But I didn't use anything like that. Now, here's an interesting one. We have Bill Gates on one side, and we have Steve Jobs on another side. Look at their slides. Which one is more understandable? Here's Bill, very successful, by the way. He's talking about Windows right there. It, it, there's even a Mac there. And there's Steve. Which one is more effective? So keep them simple. Uh, today we're reading in the papers about Whitey, Whitey Bulger and the mob and all that. So I was thinking, uh, remember John Gotti? He was a mobster. He was acquitted when his defense team put together one slide. And here it is. Here's the slide they put together. Uh, here's his defense team. I'll make the slide a little bigger. And what they did is they took all of the government witnesses, these are the government witnesses testifying against Gotti, and what they did is they looked at their police record. 
Now, as a, as a pastor, I'm particularly offended by this. This guy pistol whipped a priest. <laughs> now, I want to know how, how viable is his testimony? A, uh, he was acquitted. Gotti was acquitted based on this slide because the, the jury looked at this and said, pistol whip a priest? And we're going to believe his testimony? Of course not. So one slide can win the day. Now, so now we're going to pay attention to the audience attention span. Today, our attention spans are so short that you have to keep bringing them back. And I find that about every 10 minutes, I have to show you a video or I'll lose you. I can't just keep telling you over and over again. So let's, make a, let's pretend you are a maintenance super and you're talking to your maintenance crew in the morning. That's the 8 o'clock meeting and you're going to talk to them today about changing this choke valve. Okay, guys, um, today we're going to talk about changing the choke valve down here, you know. And uh, you all know up here uh, that there's this, uh, this line here, and it's got polyethylene in it, and it's a line pressure. And we're going to have to take this, uh, this valve here. Make sure that one's closed now, boys. And uh, this, then we'll take this choke valve off here, and we'll, we'll clean out the choke. How, they're, they're in third stage of anesthesia by now. You know, they, they haven't had their coffee yet. <laughs> so how do I wake them up? I show them a film. Here it is. At 1.04 p.m. Monday, October 23rd, 1989, an explosion that registered 3.5 on the Richter scale rocked a chemical plant in Pasadena, Texas. On the day of the Pasadena blast, a key valve that isolated a polyethylene reactor from where product collects was closed to permit scheduled maintenance. Somehow, 90,000 pounds of gaseous ethylene isobutane escaped almost instantly from the reactor through the 10-inch valve, pushing at nearly 900 pounds per square inch pressure. Once free, the vapor went searching for an ignition source. Heat is an important part of making plastic, so it didn't have far to go. 23 employees were killed and 314 were injured. The fire took 10 hours to bring under control. Do I have their attention? Absolutely. There are plenty of resources out there that you can use. Here's an illustration. I have several of these books by Trevor Kelts. What went wrong? And so each day as we bring the maintenance folks together, we can use another story and show what went wrong. And they'll learn because these stories are compelling. The one I just showed you is in the book. And the, a lot of the films are available on YouTube. So now let's begin to polish this all together with a story. And we use, in our business, illustrations. That's often a bottom line approach. And now to bring this all together, we use these videos. Now, don't make it so that you have to go to your PC and boot up the video. As soon as you do that, you've lost them. It has to be embedded. How do you do that? Lots of videos on YouTube. I go to Firefox. And Firefox has this downloader thing with three little balloons. You can push on that. It says download. That comes down, and it's often in an FLV format. If you're using Microsoft, you can't use FLV, so you'll have to use a little free software called iSoft or something like that. There's lots of them out there that convert one format to another format. If you're in Windows, it has to be WMV, Windows Media Video. If you're in Apple, it uses anything. So once you get it, it won't be what you want it. So you can use Movie Maker in Windows, or you can use iMovie in Apple and slice and dice it. Virtually nothing that I have in here is stock standard. I load in videos. Now, if I'm in, uh, trying to build a, uh, a budget for a head box control in a paper mill, and I want to talk about variability, I can put a video behind my text. So when I'm talking about head box variability control, I got this head box underneath here running, and I've got the attention a whole lot better than if I'm layering bullets one after another. So load in video and make them interactive. Now we'll polish it off and we'll be done. There's something very key that you need to know. Do not fill your speeches with throwaway statements. 
How many times do you say, you know? How many times do you throw in, okay? Those are throwaway statements that will actually detract from your speech. They won't add to it. Why do we do this? Anybody know? It's because we're afraid of silence. We, we abhor silence, but silence is powerful. When you, when you stop talking, everybody comes to, to four. So don't fill your speeches with a lot of you knows, okay, ahs, ands. Listen to yourself. Have a, a colleague with a little p pad and paper mark down every time you say one of these things. It will be amazing. You'll think, I didn't say that at all but you do. So you have to listen to yourself, even if you tape record. I hate listening to myself, but you have to force yourself to do that. Now the question is, how do you dress? You hear lots of people talk about how you dress. Does it matter? Yes or no? Really, it doesn't. You got Steve Jobs in his jeans, right? Uh, you got Zuckerberg in his hoodie. And uh, of course, Chambers is wearing his $3,000 sport coat. And just basically dress like everybody else. But I'll tell you the one thing you have to do. You must dress with humility. If you use personal pronouns like I, me, my, and you be begin to brag about yourself, they'll check out every time. The book of Proverbs talks about dressing with humility. It will win every time. Make fun of yourself. Tell stories on yourself because the audience will identify with you. Don't set yourself up on a pedestal. As soon as you do, you've lost them. All right, then our final point, the hook. Most people, especially engineers, they don't set up the antagonist, and the last thing they do is they don't ask for the order. We end up with our pre presentations, we run out of time and we step down. You are there to get a change of heart. You need a decision, and there is no time better for that decision to be made than right now. So as, as uh, engineers, we are loath to ask for the order, but do it. Otherwise, don't speak. And so I, I can't drive that thing home enough. You have to ask for the order. All right, finally, we have to wrap this thing together. How did I start? All right, so if I started with the King's speech, where should I end? I should end with the king's speech. So, here it is. So my point for you today is if a speech can save a kingdom. I guarantee you it can launch your career. Thank you very much.